Hello everyone, both on site and online, and welcome to the first public infra project presentations. Infravis is a national Swedish research infrastructure that is comprised of nine partner universities, and it enables scientific discovery through state-of-the-art visualization support. No matter the type of research data or material that you have, reach out and we are here to help you. My name is Katja Voxell, Infravis Communications Officer, and I will be moderating today's event. Today you're going to learn more about two Infravis, three Infravis projects. Medical Digital Twin, presented by Infravis user Gunnar Sedersund and Infravis application expert Gustav Eriksson. Extended Rephotography, presented by a Gothenburg University uh, node coordinator Jonathan Westin, and in situ visualization support for AMR meshes in NEC 5000, presented by KTH node coordinator Mario Romero Vega and Infravis senior visualization expert Tino Weinkauf. The presentations will last for 10 minutes, after which we'll open up for questions for four minutes. Those of you who are sitting here in the dome can ask questions during the after the presentations by raising your hand. And those of you joining us on Zoom, please type in your question in the chat during the presentation and I will read them out for you. Having said that, I give floor to our first speakers, Gunnar Sedersund and Gustav Eriksson, please. The floor is yours. So let's see if we make this work. Okay, so uh, my name is Gunnar, and this is Gustav, and uh, we are going to present uh, a project called Medical Digital Twin, and here you see a symbolic representation of a digital twin, so it's a computer copy of a person where you can look inside the organs and you can see what, what's going to happen when you do different types of things. So just a, an overview of different types of projects we are involved in. Here is one where we where we work with the, with the, with the face and the, and, the, and, the, and the brain behind this. So all the time when these type of activities are happening, you can see what's happening in the brain behind it. You can also look inside the heart and see how the blood flow is animated. And um, you can, uh, you can uh, make the twin move around and you can see the, the biomechanics of it. Um, and this is the most similar to what I will present, but uh, it basically started with me and Ingrid Hotz having a project on describing what happens if you look inside the liver and uh, if you change your diet, uh, the, the fat in the liver will disappear. And here you, see, here you see that process. This is a small part of the liver animated. Um, so, uh, and then this sort of led to our Infravis project here. Uh, so, uh, I will explain a little bit how the underlying computation and models behind all of these animations has been built up over, over the last 20 years approximately. So, so basically we collaborate with experts that knows the mechanisms and has lots of data. And we convert the mechanisms into ordinary differential equations and then we either, uh, we try to fit to the data and either have to reject the hypothesis or we check if it not only can explain existing data, but also predict new data. If it can, we bring it into the big picture and then use it to simulate. Uh, so here we see a, a comparison between data, uh, which are the dots, and simulations, which are the lines for healthy, type two diabetics, and also simulated improvement. So basically we can go from mechanistic insights to uh, sort of uh, uh, applications in the real world uh, in, a, in a faster way. So zooming in a little bit more on the models before we turn to the visualization, uh, the first thing we characterized was how insulin binds to the insulin receptor. And the, the, this was published in 2010. And then we, we moved on to describe how this leads to uh, the whole intracellular signaling network to increased glucose uptake, how this goes wrong in type 2 diabetes. And this is based on these type of data. So if we just take one of them here, we see what happens inside the fat cell if we add insulin. So first, the phosphorylation of the insulin receptor goes up and then down, both in the data, which are the, which are the dots, and the simulations. In the same way, we can do for the organs, uh, so this is a meal response, and this particular model has been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for replacing animal experiments in certain applications. And then, for the longest time scale, we, we can even simulate how the weight is changing. 
And these type of simulations, which are all validated by data, are then brought into machine learning models that can calculate the risk of a stroke. So here we have three different scenarios for a 40-year-old man, slightly overweight, coming to a health conversation, which is a medical intervention. And then we can simulate three different lifestyles, and then three different things will happen. In one, the, the sort of the risk of a stroke here will be will, will low throughout uh, throughout uh, the life. Uh, in one, uh, he will develop atrial fibrillation, and in one, he will also develop diabetes. And as you see, the risk of a stroke here is dramatically different. In the same way, we can simulate what happens if you take a blood pressure medication. And the hypothesis here is that by seeing this type of future scenarios for yourself that will bring further impact to what uh, dietists and nurses and doctors anyway say and thereby increase motivation and compliance. So, uh, these type of curves is not what you want to show because it's sort of difficult to understand that. So we want to visualize what happens in the body when you do different things, when you eat and exercise and take medications. Visualize it as it happens in real time, but also this condensed time uh, so you see how the body would change over the next months or, or, or the next years. And thereby providing a context uh, that is more relatable and accessible than graphs. So, how do you have your own? Okay, I can take the clicker. Y yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gunnar. So now I will explain what we have done in this Infravis project. And I'll start with a, just a quick system overview of what goes into what Gunnar has already done and what we have done. So, first of all, we have a, the back end. Uh, this is where all the simulation happens. This is where all the simulation models reside. And based on patient data, you can also get patient-specific simulations back. Then you have some sort of a front end, which is basically the user interface that they interact with where they can send requests for different simulations and receive back simulated results in the form of, of graphs. And then we add in here our new avatar application, which is a 3D application with, with uh, patient avatars, uh, which can be applied with animations, we can morph their bodies, and this is then streamed back to the front end. So you control the 3D environment through the front end, uh, but it all happens on a different computer. To create the patient avatars, we use a system called MetaHuman. So this is a free, easy to use tech for creating uh, custom human avatars. It's accessible through the browsers, so this, you don't need a, a powerful computer to create these. And we can then add them into Unreal Engine, where they come in fully rigged for animation. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, William, the, the postdoc who's also working on the project. Uh, you're gonna see him a lot. So we start with the face scan of the patient, which creates this uh, geometry you see here. And then we convert it into a metahuman head, which we then apply body features to, such as hair, eyes, and uh, yeah, skin color. And then you bring it into the application. Um, so the patient uh, starts by customizing their metahuman based on the face scan to make it look like themselves, something they connect with. We can then import it into the Unreal Engine application. And then in the final application, patients can only access themselves. So not like this. Uh, so the data is protected for you. We can morph the body between uh, different weights. And this can then be uh, connected to simulations, as we talked about, uh, for example, uh, diets or exercise. And this, uh, instead of only a graph, you also show the actual progress over time on your body. Let's see if the uh, better view there. Uh, we can also play animations on these avatars. So you can show yourself performing different motions. Uh, this can be a workout, a rehab exercise. You can also show potential progress if, if you do a rehab co correctly, like you get increased motion. And the goal in the end here is to record motion capture with medical professionals. So for example, stroke rehab exercises that you can then play on your own body. Uh, there's also this uh, transparent inspection mode where you can look closer at your organs. And then you can select organs to get uh, information about you from the backend simulations. And this is basically uh, an interface to understand and explore what happens in your body. For example, 
what happens in your heart uh, during uh, exercise, or what happens uh, with uh, your liver fat uh, based on the diet that you're doing. Uh, you can also change context of, of the application. Uh, this allows for different environments, and this is basically to contextualize the data that you're looking at. So if you're looking at exercises, you're at the gym, uh, but if you're doing medical examinations, then you're at a hospital looking at your organs. And this 3D application is run on a powerful computer, and is then connected through a technology called pixel streaming to the front end uh, through WebRTC. So you can basically run this application on your browser or just in your phone. Um, and you don't need such a powerful computer, you can, yeah, uh, anyone can use the application without, the only thing you need is a web uh, uh, connection. Okay, so uh, basically to sum up, um, um, the, the benefits of this InfraVest project is that our own expertise um, is world unique in terms of the underlying models, uh, but uh, the only thing that we can do is to show graphs, so, so we really need help with the, with the, with the animation. And uh, uh, so this is not our expertise. Uh, so we had enormous value of using InfraVis and this uh, weekly meetings with, with Gustav. Um, and, uh, and this will to be submitted soon. Uh, and uh, it's also part of an EU project that is uh, kicking off uh, next week, 1st of May. So that's it for us. Please. Thank you. Um, do we have questions here in the dome? Because we haven't gotten any questions in the chat. And I encourage people in the, uh, on Zoom to submit their questions during the presentation so that I can read them out. Now, anyone in the dome? Mario Romero, please. Oh, OK. Sorry. <clears throat> yes. sorry, no problem. I was just wondering, when would it be ready to try it out on real patients for the first time? Um, well, in this EU project, we will do it in in uh, in different contexts, both for prevention in this health conversation, uh, but also in rehabilitation of stroke patients, for instance. Uh, so it will be tested out in a few different countries. First test will be uh, next year uh, on real patients. Thank you so much for that. It was super fun, great project, great presentation. The question is, you're able to modify body mass, but you're only changing um, body fat content, from what I could see. You're not changing muscle mass. Would that be something you also want to explore? And, and if you can do that, for example, can you also simulate an injury and then see how you get back from that injury? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of, as a user of, of your research, you know, I want to see how I'm doing. So yeah. muscle mass and recovering from injury. Yeah, so we can simulate, uh, uh, that to some extent already, but that's certainly in the pipeline to develop more of an exercise, so for weightlifters or for people who want to sort of uh, build up their their, uh, their muscle mass. Uh, for sure, that's uh, that's a very nearby application that is within the scope of what we're looking. Uh, and bone density as well. You could think about if you want to take it even further, because yeah. you yeah. it could go up. Yeah. Uh, I can also speak to uh, from the visualization perspective. What we're doing right now is having different body types, and then you basically just linearly morph between those body types. So it's not on a, on a granular level of uh, this muscle, how th that will change, but you can add morph targets, of course, to, to each and every uh, part of the body. Uh, basically, it's, it's all about how much detail you add into it. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? If not, then we have one minute left for one last question, which I can ask you, and I think this one goes to Gustav, and related to what we have been talking about. I wanted to ask you about context. You had check up at the doctor's diet, exercise. Do you envision to have more context and take it outside of the lab, for example, when one is uh, dancing at a club or um, when you're doing exercises at work, you know, these short break exercises that we do, and the effects of these would be interesting to see. What's your vision? Well, so we have the possibility to add more environments, and we have uh, discussed these, of course. Uh, and it's all based on, on uh, what kind of simulations Gunnar uh, and his team is, is running. Uh, 
Um, so, but from the context of the application, it's it's quite easy to uh, add. We build a system where you can add more well different environments. And maybe you want to speak to like what kind of simulations you're wishing or other contexts. Yeah, so so the dance thing, we actually have done such a thing, uh, so, and uh, hopefully we'll do uh, again in the autumn. Uh, so I'm, I'm working together with one of the best ballet dancers in the world, and we have a sort of interactive uh, experience where people from the audience have digital twins created, and then they are part of the dance performance, where we also look at what happens inside the body when they are dancing. Awesome. <laughs> And with that, we thank you wholeheartedly. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> and let us welcome our next speaker, Jonathan West in Extended Re-Photography. Please. Thank you. So in uh, this project here, we have uh, aided the project Extended Rephotography by building this online collaborative spatiotemporal visualization tool. That's a bit of a mouthful, but I will show you what it's all about. Extended Rephotography, this is this multi-year interdisciplinary project on climate change and the impact of climate change on natural landscapes. It's headed by Tyrone Martinson, which is a professor in photography. And the project is developing uses of uh, extended reality, XR technologies, to basically show this transformation in various ways. They have been focusing a lot on uh, 360 video and uh, virtual reality helmets to present this landscape at various um, interactions and various times in its career. And they are also extending traditional photography by matching this with advances in photographic documentation and high-resolution video. Rephotography is both an analytical method and a means of communication. It is very much rooted in artistic research, and I would say that it's, it defies this, uh, these any attempts at abstraction. Uh, we need to be ground in this visual visual representation of the landscape here. Yeah. And uh, we can't really translate these this changes into numbers. The impact of this project relies on the visual communication of the effect of climate change, not presenting something that uh, would perhaps be a bit more like analytical interfaces on top of this. So I would say also that this familiarity with the place that it inspires Empathy and empathy is crucial when it comes to bringing about change, getting people to know what's actually happening out there. Most of us, of course, don't have the possibility to go to Svalbard just on on, but it's there. It's on Svalbard, places like North Pole and the South Pole, where we can see the most dramatic changes of climate change, and that is something, of course, that will just <laughs> affect us uh, more more uh, later on where we live. The data that they brought home from Svalbard consists of uh, very high resolution photographs, 360 degrees video, 3D models, and observations such as weather data. They also had historical documentation like photographs, maps, plans uh, that they had both gained through early expeditions but also through collaborations. What was required from InfraWIS was Primarily, or first at least, uh, this uh, expertise within uh, development of web development and UX design and those kind of things. But we also noticed when we work with this that we had a broader expertise that we could contribute with in regards to data modeling and management. And we also established this uh, path of communication between the research project and Svensk Nationell Datatjänst, SND that also was very fruitful for all of this because they got this material that they wouldn't have gotten for and of course the research team got this way of publishing and archiving the data. But primarily our goal was to develop this uh, online collaborative spatiotemporal visualization tool. So based on the data model, uh, we created a backend through which the, mm, they collaboratively could you know, basically organize the research data as events in space and time. 
on top of this, we built the front end uh, that also fetches this high resolution images from the Norwegian Polar Institute, these big orthophotos that go down to, you know, also perhaps like in Mars, Mars that we saw earlier today. But um, uh, we can uh, go into this and we can also then uh, filter this material based on time span and categories and get the data that is from partic particular places in time and in space. We make available different types of interfaces for the various material categories. Uh, for instance, if a photo is a rephotography, we automatically detect that and bring them together and have this interface so the researchers and the public could then explore this in various ways by comparing. As the photos are really high resolution, uh, we have also this system built on triple IF where we can have photos that are one gigabyte, two gigabytes, hundreds of megapixels that they can then zoom in easily, something that for some of the researchers, they were not able, available to do that on their own computers. But here is a way to share this data also, since every zoom position and every position within this image is also generating a unique uh, URL, so they can then link this, send this as a link to the other research and show exactly what they are looking at. One of the more um, fantastic thing that they brought with them is this narration of the landscape by Torona, where he sits in the landscape and he talks about the changes. So we're able then through this map interface to place him at the various points in this landscape and then you can just listen to him. You can listen to him all day because it's fantastic. Unfortunately, we don't have sound here. And then look around and also at the same time get this grasp of the landscape and uh, you know, get a feel for it. As I said before, familiarize yourself with it. We also in the tool make use of a lot of external available data sources uh, that help contextualize the research data. Uh, for instance, one such data source is the historical posi position of the glaciers, which we then add as these layers on top of the present day autophoto. And through that, we are also able to put in relation the documentation from the same time span. So we're looking to adding more and more on those going back in time. I think we have data going back to the beginning of the 20th century at least. The largest impact that I would say that InfraVis have had on the project concerns this workflow of making the data available both to themselves as a research group, because it moved from just being in this silo position on the re different researchers' computers into this collaborative tool where they can start interacting it with it together, but also make it available for the public, make it available for future researchers. And through this tool, they have this system to both organizing the data, visualizing it, publishing it, and also since we are building this collaboration with s and also archiving it and making it available for you know, many, many years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I get sound? Thank you. Do we have questions? Yes, please. Hello. Uh, so, uh, so my question is, uh, what about uh, VR, if you're talking about uh, an immersive experience for these types of things? Yes, uh, this group, uh, they had quite you know, a lot of experience working themselves with various types of technologies. So they are, they were down in, or up rather, in Svalbard, uh, collecting this material with intention of doing VR installations, uh, pretty much, you know, doing that as, uh, more artistic way, being able to show this data, but also as a way to bring knowledge and uh, bring, uh, yeah, basically bring the landscape to the people, <laughs> since we can't bring the people to the landscape often. So they had that already covered within the team. What they didn't have covered was how to make this available to a broader public and also how to, how to organize it in various ways. So they are just thought mo mostly about these small uh, interventions during the project. So this was a way for, for us to help them uh, to basically read, uh, reach a broader audience with the material. But yeah, uh, it's, it's very much important for them, the whole VR and the way of 
situating the viewer inside the landscape. Mm -hmm. There's another question, Matthias Wallergott. Thank you so much, this is all great. Uh, I was just curious uh, if you plan to do any evaluations of these systems. I mean, a lot of people are, as we know, very prone to, even though they see what's happening, they're very good in cognitively filter out any information about climate change. So how do you think the most stubborn climate change denier would react on this? I, I think it's very hard to reach them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, so I think that it's, we, we can just keep trying at least, and through these new technologies being able to, as, as if we can make them feel something about this, I, th I think that's the first step. And I think these technologies that we are starting to get you know, available, they, they are starting to push in this thing about making a landscape mobile so we can get here, we can, we can go to Mars, we can go to Svalbard, we can go to Antarctica, various places, but then we just have to refine how, how do, do we do research in this? How do we communicate it? How do we add narratives to this that also make people feel so they are not, so they know the importance of them? So I think perhaps it's not always enough to just show good images, show go 360. We need to put them into this narrative of this, what is happening, and do a bit of the legwork when it comes to that. Since they don't have this whole, uh, my pet peeve when it comes to digital environments is that the whole, bodily experience of traveling there is something that's open missing when we are just instantly transported there. We need to be able to communicate that hardship and that feeling also a bit. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I'm happy for the project. Uh, I'm Monica. I'm the director of Infravis. Uh, I, we are sitting in a dome. And when I see this, you know, around, could, th could this be, you know, adjusted to a dome if anyone can answer me? Yes. Uh, I could just say that uh, the... Um, the project is standard photography. They have also initiated um, uh, discussions with the uh, Universium and the dome there to do something with the material because they have these, they are both 180 and 360 uh, photos. And that is also something that we from Infravis will help them with how to think about their material in relation to a dome. That's why I think it's so great to be here for these two days because this is also a way for me to gain experience of what is possible in a dome. So I will be able to then help them with various solutions. One more question, Larry. We have time for one more. Yes. Could you briefly talk about the team, the Infravis team, and the roles that the team members played in the project, please? Yes, I could. We had uh, a number of people involved during the, the process of working this, both in the first you know, meetings with the, uh, with the project leader and the continuous meeting about collecting the data and. So we had, for instance, um, Jeremy, who come from the part of uh, Chalmers, part of the Gothenburg node, that had previously worked also on S and D. Had a lot of experience with data modeling and the possibilities of uh, archiving these kind of things. So he had a very close collaboration with the team. But then we also had the UX designers, those that were very well versed in triple IF technologies and those kind of things that worked. We had. My expertise is also working with polar regions, so I know what kind of material were out there to collect and add to this, uh, to make the data more interesting, to be able to triangulate information and show more than just their individual data. So I think that's also quite important that we have this aspect where we, we are a bit at Infravis experts through the different projects, so we became a bit minor experts in a lot of different fields, and we can bring in that experience and also help with data. We can then see, well, you, we could perhaps do this with the data since we have been working with that on other occasions, stuff like that. So I think it's been, uh, I think something that's only going to get better during Infravis that we get more and more experience and be able to relate back and also gain from other experts within Infravis. We can ask about you over there, you worked in that project. This is something similar. What could you help us with here? So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jonathan. <laughs> Closing the loop of this presentation with Infravis contribution in details, we present now the next presentation by Tina Weinkauf. Please. Thank you very much. 
So this is a project that works with the simulation of fluids around wings and it's in a supercomputing context. On one end we have the flow researchers, Philip and Fermin. On the other end we have visualization researchers, myself and Jahui, who do not only work in terms of visualization research, but also as a backend in visualization expertise for the application experts coming into this project, namely the InfraVis application expert Ingemar Markström, and also an application expert from a different infrastructure, the KTH Supercomputing Center PDC, Adam Peplinski, was also part of the project. So and in this project, the flow researchers are looking at a scenario where you know flow is going around the wing and what's happening is the flow particles come to the wing and then of course some of them go under the wing, some of them above the wing and they typically follow very nicely the shape of the wing up until a point where they do not anymore and they detach from the wing. So you have certain areas on the wing where the flow particles nicely follow it and then other areas where the flow is detached. And the more detached flow you have, the less force, the less lift is generated by the swing. Yeah? Lift being the force that keeps your airplane, of course, in the air. And there is this moment when you have so much detached flow over the wing that you do not generate enough force anymore and your plane falls down. And that's a situation that you would like to avoid, of course. And pilots have different ways of getting out of it, um, but we don't want to get there. So this is one thing that is being explored here. The other aspect is also that having too much detached flow, you require a lot of energy then to keep up the lift. Um, so you want to avoid this detachment, basically. And the more you avoid it, the less energy you use for starting, flying, and landing your plane. So this can only be taken care of by simulating these kinds of phenomena using first principles, going back to the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, simulating them with direct numerical simulations, and then also analyzing and visualizing this appropriately. All of this can only happen on supercomputers, you know, where we have enough computational power to deal with that. For the ones who are not so familiar with supercomputers, supercomputers are a little bit like a prison, a data prison. They generate so much data and it is very hard to get out of there. So the time it takes to save the data is orders of magnitude more than the time it takes to compute it. And it already takes months to compute this kind of stuff. So it's completely out of the question that we can save the data to disk. Hence, you know, you may, you may save one time step or ten time steps, but these kinds of simulations require hundred thousands of time steps. So 99% of the data will never see the light of day, it will always stay within that prison. And so what's therefore being done already for quite some time is that you create your visualization data analysis software and you develop it in a way that it runs on the supercomputer right next to the simulation and it stops the simulation from time to time and says, hey, wait, wait, wait a moment. And it looks at the data while it is in memory, it is not being saved to disk. While it is being in memory, it's visualizing it and then the simulation is allowed to continue. You repeat the process several times and this is how this video has been created. This video has been rendered on a supercomputer during the simulation. Now this kind of interface between these two groups existed from previous projects. This pilot project now came in because the flow researchers did something they applied and got awarded to be um, among the first batch of users for Europe's largest supercomputer, Lumi. It's situated in the north of Finland and has just been inaugurated last year. So the researchers were awarded 80 million core hours to be spent in one year. That's quite an honor. It's a very large allocation. And so in order to <coughs> use this appropriately, 
they said we would like to exploit this machine very well and we would like to go away from the kind of meshes that we used in the past, which were rather static meshes uh, designed at the beginning and wouldn't change over time, and would like to go to meshes that are yeah, that have adaptive mesh refinement, so the cells would become larger during the simulation or smaller depending on the resolution constraints that you have in the simulation. And that broke the link between the simulation and the visualization. Suddenly, we couldn't analyze the data anymore while it is being computed and simulated on the supercomputer. And that's where our application experts came in. And that is uh, Ingmar and Adam from PDC and Infravis, who worked on the code to make this connection happen again. Basically, support for these kinds of meshes in the software. This had to be programmed in Fortran and in C++. Libraries like MPI, the message passing interface, had to be used. And it was one part and one goal of this project also to instill the knowledge of how do I program for a supercomputer, how do I use a supercomputer, how do I visualize on a supercomputer, to instill this knowledge into InfraVis. And that was also successful. So here you see the actual grid, or rather a slice of it, and the little dot there in the middle is then the wing over here, and there's a very fine grid around it. We have almost 300 million vertices, and uh, it's a lot of data. So the computations have not all finished yet. Remember, it takes a lot of time to do that. Um, but we have already some first results that we took from the surface of the wing. And it now appears two-dimensional, but it's from the surface of the wing, so you can spread it out in 2D. And then these little red dots are these backflow events that create this detached flow. And then at the very end, you have that oh, detached over there. So And, and the, the goal now of the research is now to track all of these little red dots, see how they merge, create a graph, basically, of them merging, and then run graphical um, and statistical algorithms on that. The second part of our pilot project is concerned with creating an educational video that we submitted to the Gallery of Fluid Motion. That's an annual event, happens in the United States at the American Physical Society once a year, and flow visualization people from all over the world submit their best work in order to be seen by a jury and then be awarded. Our humble attempt this year did not get awarded, but here you see three award winners from this year. I have to say, this gallery of fluid motion does not only contain computational videos and visualizations, but we also compete there against people that use photography and video cameras to make flow, real world flow, visible. Yeah? And so the concept here uh, of the video um, relates to the flattener rotor. The flattener rotor is a form of a wing, but it's not horizontally attached to a plane, but vertically attached to, for example, a ship. And it's a cylinder, a metal cylinder, and you need some form of motor to rotate it. And then in those places where the wind direction is aligned with the rotational direction of the cylinder, the wind becomes fast. In the opposite side of the cylinder, the rotational direction of the cylinder and the wind is not aligned and therefore the wind becomes slower there. This creates a pressure differential which pushes the ship in one direction. Yeah. And then here we have the video that we produced for that, or parts of that video, I have to say. This has been rendered in Blender, for example. You see the ship, you see the rotating cylinder, and then here you see isosurfaces of pressure uh, blue being negative or, or low pressure and red being high pressure. And you see already this, this, this pressure differential that pushes the ship in one direction. Using these kinds of flattener rotors, you can save up to 25% of energy, for example, on a ship. And of course, you know what kind of diesel is burned on a ship. That is, of course, very good for the environment to do so. You can find this in the real world if you go to Geza in Denmark and take the ferry over to Rostock, Germany. There is one of the so-called hybrid ferries that actually uses uh, a flattener rotor today. The impact of our pilot project so far is two workshop papers. One submission to the Gallery of Fluid Motion, and we're also planning on at least two journal publications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation, Tino. Do we have questions in the audience? Mario, please.
Thank you. I have a question about the material of the wing, because you say that particles detach and you are modeling the geometry of the wing. Have people been thinking about also could different materials at the surface when you have the contact with the air help the particles not detach from the wing, the air particles? <clears throat> yes, uh, so there are um, uh, attempts at doing that. Um, people looked at how sharks, the, the, the skin of sharks is uh, being uh, structured um, and, and they tried to replicate this in the paint of the wing or of, of airplanes in general. And this does have an effect, quite an effect actually. The only problem is you need to maintain that and uh, planes get dirty and these kinds of things. So you cannot rely necessarily on this being always the case over the lifetime of a plane and so on and so forth. So it's, I don't think it's actively used right now, but I have seen research projects in this regard. And, and I can imagine the adaptive mesh can be, like there you can really um, go into the fine detail if you have the adaptive mesh model. Yes, absolutely, yes, that's exactly. what we do there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Do we have more questions? Mm, then, Okay, one more. I Please had another question. Ahead. I just wanted you know if anybody else has a question. We looked at the section of the wing, like a thin section of the wing, I but mean, but we don't have like the the full wing, right? Um, is this enough to sort of understand, or the full wing geometry would make a difference? Yeah. So what you? It's always difficult to see the wing, actually, right? I'm not sure if everyone did, but like, do I have a, a pointer? Yeah. The yeah. Um, so that's the wing over here, this gray thing, right? And it really doesn't look like a, it looks a little bit like a wing, but not the full wing, right? So it's not attached to a plane right now, it doesn't end somewhere. So it looks more like a piece of salmon that you get in a supermarket or something like that. And that, that's, that's how you can best describe it, right? And the reason is that a number of phenomena that the people look at here can just be described using this small slice of a wing, basically. You don't need it to be um, finite. So what, what also, <laughs> the, the, the fluid dynamicist described this as an infinite wing. Yeah, it's only a small slice, but if a flow particle goes out on the right side, it immediately comes in on the, on the left side again. So it's actually on a mathematical level infinite. It's a loop, basically. And, uh, and, and that's how the computations are done. Yeah. Thank you. We Is have another question. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. So. But having seen the, the fluid dynamics uh, community driving the, the development of, uh, of or the need for larger and larger supercomputers, um, my question is sort of philosophical. Do you see an end where it's beyond any point of, of resolving these vortices anymore? Uh, how much more or how much larger modules would you need? I don't think we're there yet. The Navier-Stokes equations are still orders of magnitude more complicated than what we can compute right now, like that in, in terms of what we really need. Um, why do we even need to go so into the details of this? I mean, some flow researchers are not, right? Some flow researchers use, use models. Uh, I mean, remember that climate researchers model the Earth's wind system uh, in a much uh, shorter uh, computational time. They use other models, basically, right? People go so low into the fine details because turbulence is such an important problem. Um, a lot of energy, it is estimated that around 50% of all the energy that we use to transport goods and people is lost due to turbulence. So think of your car moving 50% of that is because of the energy that you need is just spent on the turbulence behind the car. Uh, think of oil or gas or water or whatever in a pipeline where we transport these kinds of liquid goods. Um, again, a lot of energy spent in the turbulence between the, the wall and the liquid. So if we can understand these phenomena better, uh, the surfaces, uh, optimize the surfaces or the bends or whatever we have, the better it is for our energy consumption as well. So that's why people want to go there. Thank you very much. Yes, there's one more question. And Thank you. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I'd like interesting 
thing to get from comparison of this numerical data with some uh, real simulation. So you showed that there is topic of visualization with photography and with calculation. So the, is there any way and uh, interest to extract from comparison between numerics and a real simulation? Uh, no, real photography, a real experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is done uh, a number of times. Um, you can most definitely compare using images and videos. That's always an easy way to compare and to then you see qualitatively similar phenomena, definitely. From a wind tunnel experiment, you make the videos and then you make visualizations uh, of the numerical simulations. You will see similar qualitative um, uh, results. What I don't see so often yet is to use the real world data to really instill it into the to simulations. Uh, there are first attempts, of course, at using machine learning models to speed up these simulations and to basically solve some parts of the Navier-Stokes equations using machine learning. Um, but um, yeah, that's about it when it comes to data, real world to, to simulated data. Yeah. Mm -hmm.